Hi everyone, I'm excited today to bring you Jay Rain. Jane's been a franchisee for almost two years now in the fencing business, serving the greater Minneapolis area. So I'm excited to kind of hear his story and share his journey in becoming a franchisee and, and having a ton of success really early, which is what we're going to hear about. So welcome to the show, Jay. Thanks, Brian. Excited to be here. Awesome. So uh, how'd you get into franchising? Like walk me back, I guess more than two years ago where like, what was the point where you said, hey, franchising's like, is what I'm going to do. Great question. I mean, I I went down the path of uh, you know looking at SMB Twitter and thinking that I wanted to outright buy a business for a, a couple of years. Probably about 2020 rolled around, and I said, all right, I'm I want to get out of corporate. Um, I, I worked in medical device sales for seven years, and it was a great industry, but I always wanted to be my own boss and get out of the corporate grind. And so I was in, I was looking and evaluating businesses to buy outright, and I just decided, okay, you know, three or four million bucks for an SBA loan, it's a little bit more than I really want to stomach. And so I decided, okay, I could go with a franchise, get the business in a box, so to speak, put in a bunch of sweat equity for a couple of years, and take out maybe one tenth of that of a loan. And so that's why I decided to go the franchise route. It's just a, a lower equity, you know, a lower investment. Um, in order to get eventually, hopefully, to a size um, that's able to support my family, and so far it's worked out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a that's a great point. I think a lot of people, you know, we talk about buying, you know, buying a business, right? And in, in the the how great it sounds. And honestly, once you're a franchisee, for you to go out and buy another fencing company now, probably wouldn't feel that heavy, right? You probably, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but like, you probably wouldn't mind taking on debt to buy another one. You already know the business, like you you know what you can make it do. But like buying a total unknown business, taking on a ton of debt and something you know nothing about, and then you know really relying on the, you know the owner to have to teach you everything, right? Because um, I've thought, you know, I've looked at independent businesses too, even I'm the franchise guy. But I still like, I have those those same fears of well, what if you know, I don't know. So what about you? What what are I guess some of the things you kind of thought through, of I guess the pros and the cons, and and, and really why, you know, this made sense. Yeah. So I, you know. I've never owned, you know, my own business. I'm not the I'm not the guy that was like in college grinding a side hustle or anything. Like yeah, that was not yeah, yeah. that was not me. You know, you hear those stories of people like, "Oh, I used to sell You were Nick Huber with your uh, self-storage uh, box <laughs> no, thing. Not quite. I look up to Nick <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, but no, yeah, I yeah. wasn't that guy at all. Yeah, like yeah. I, I worked in corporate. In fact, I mean, out of college, I was a, a golf pro at the country club where I grew up in okay. outside of Houston, Texas, and then I decided, "All right, enough of that." And then I got into, like I said, I got into corporate and I, I'd never owned my own business. I'd never run my own thing. So going into this, I was a little nervous. Like there's a lot of risk here. You know, I don't want to take a few million dollar SBA loan personally guaranteed. I'd rather do something a lot smaller, you know, three to $400,000 to get everything started. You know, God forbid this whole thing went south. I could stomach that and I wouldn't be, you know, living on the yep. street. Yep. What was your kind of process in terms of like, analyzing franchises like you you ended up on you know superior fence and rail it's like you know a fencing concept but like how many things did you look at like what was your criteria that like you wanted to see within a brand yeah i i evaluated probably almost a dozen different brands um i wanted to my thought process i looked at everything from like like uh what do they call them like uh plasma rich platement injections mm -hmm. and and, and yep. things to like I just wanted to, honestly, I wanted for my first business to be something simple that I can understand that I would buy as a customer that doesn't take, you know, basically if I have to go sell this, like people know what I'm selling. I, I looked at another, I don't, you're probably familiar with like smash my trash and those types of businesses. Yep. Um, I just wanted to show up to, you know, a warm lead, know that this is something that somebody wants. I don't have to yep. explain to them what the heck I'm selling. It's something that's going to be in demand for for forever ideally yeah fences you know? aren't going away anytime soon fences aren't going away anytime <laughs> soon and i mean most you know so that that kind of led me in the direction of home services yeah and it's like okay a lot of home service brands are you know these industries are very fragmented um you know there's a lot of opportunity there it's industry that i think is just ripe for uh, professionalism and people coming in and showing up with a you know a polo on and, and looking clean and and selling jobs that aren't, you know, I, I don't think this, I don't think fences are going anywhere exactly as you said. Yeah.
Yeah, that's great. And I think one of the things that really helps, I think people on the journey is, is having that list, right? That kind of checklist in your mind, like you said, Hey, you want a simple business, something you would be a customer of something that is maybe in an un unprofessional industry that you say, Hey, the franchise is going to bring professionalism t to this, right? Which is kind of what you're buying. Um, I think that's all great. And I, I'm a, you know, I'm not a fan of, of the, you know, the, the, the plasma and the red light therapy and all this stuff, mm -hmm. just because hey. A, I'm not a customer. I've never been to it. So I, maybe, I, you know, maybe I, maybe there's a ton of benefits. I just don't understand it. But like, but then you have to sell people on the concept. You have to educate people. And like, there's this whole learning curve. And yeah, maybe there's a ton of success to be made. But, you know, wouldn't you just like to show up? Someone needs a fence, it gets fent, you know, or they got to get the house painted. And like, you have good Google reviews and, and you show up and you sell them the job and you hire, you know, and, and you make it financing, and whatever. Exactly. That's exactly what I, what my thought process was. That's why I love this, this whole home services you know, niche, yep. so to speak. And then it's about, you know, being a good operator, right? You're, you're, you're differentiating how you create values. Like you're a good operator. You're good at delivering consistent customer service. You're not, you're not like reinventing anything, right? In terms of, you know, like, like a medical related thing or something mm -hmm. that you think, Hey, this is like, there's this wide moat because of all this stuff. Like that has to be kind of like an invention versus like, you know, you're an operator, you hire great people, you follow the process and, and that's how you have success. Exactly. I didn't, you know, I did, you mentioned Nick Huber, like I, I've been consuming his content for a while. And yeah, it's like, I, I it really like that whole sweaty startup mentality. I didn't want to start up completely from scratch, like literally like, you know, yeah, write my own playbook on an entire industry and learn, but like that. And that's why I went the franchise route. Cause they give you the playbook. I'm not like a, I'm not a zero to one guy. I'm not going to like figure out I don't think I'm ever going to be in the business of franchising out anything, but like, if you give me the playbook and I think there's a lot of people out there like me, you know, that if you give me the playbook and you tell me this is how to be successful and you just go execute it, like that's all I've done. It's not rocket science. Yep. And so, um, how many territories did you buy? Uh, four. Okay. So four ter And then how, how much of that was like greater Minneapolis? Like, was that all the territories in Minneapolis? I don't know how big it is or how they do them. Yeah, but. no, I bought, I bought four of the potential, like, gosh, it must have been like nine or 10. So I, I bought the okay. southern half of the Twin Cities. So and, and was there another franchisee already in that, the northern half? There was not yet. No, I, I there, no, I, I bought just half of them. And then somebody else came in and bought the other um, five, just honestly, just a couple months after me. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and I guess, for first perspective, you know, if you could share some sales number, like what'd you guys do in your first year? What are you going to do in your second year in, in revenue? Yeah, sure. So, um, we're four territories operating as one location. Yep. Um, so we, 2023 was our first full year in operation. And, um, in that calendar year last year, we did just, we just, just over 4 million. Okay. That's that sounds strong. Where does that where does where do you rank in terms of like the the, the franchise and other other people? Yeah, so we we had a I mean we we based on my forecast. I mean we did a lot more than honestly what I forecasted. Um, I didn't What'd realize. You expect? I honestly I was I was expecting I was hoping to do two, and we ended up doing four. Okay. Um, so it, it was a much busier year than I thought we would do, um, and. Um, yeah, it, it was just I just did not expect that that amount of demand. And then we we my wife and I work full time in the business too. Yep. So it's not like I've got an operator in place like yeah, you're you know, the running guy. the day to day. Like I'm right. the guy running it for now, and my wife is helping. Uh, are you, are you in the sales calls too? I was at first. So for the first six months or so, I did all of the appointments myself. You know, I have a background in sales, so. Yeah. If I could sell, you know, a surgeon on use a spec, you know, a specific device in surgery, I think I could sell yeah, yeah. a fence to a somebody who already a split wants one. rail or a, a aluminum or whatever. Exactly. Um, so is that like would you, would you advise other people to do that if they have that skill set? Like they come from a sales background, like that they're the sales guy initially, like like, or did you kind of weigh like when you bring on that extra sales guy in payroll? Yeah, I, for, for me, it made total sense. Like I wanted to be in the weeds. This is my first business. This is the first time I've done this whole entrepreneurial, you know, adventure, so to speak. So I wanted to be in the weeds and I knew that I could sell. So I did that for the first six months in addition to operating and running the cruise. Like I was working way more than honestly I should have. I bit off probably a lot more than I, that I could, I, I could have, I could have gotten out of the sales a lot sooner. 
Um, so it was, it was about six months and I hired our first full-time sales rep. So she started, you know, I, I got really lucky. She actually worked for a competitor fence company in our market. They let her go um, due to just downsizing, I guess. They, this company blew up during COVID and then they kind mm. of progressed yeah. a little yeah. bit and she was one of the higher earners. So anyways, I was able to find somebody with experience. And then we hired our next full-time sales rep just a, another month or two after that. So now we're at about two and a half sales reps. I've got two full-time and one part-time. And then I'll, I'll still go out and do a little bit of, you know, more commercial, like bigger stuff yeah. myself. Some of the big, the big jobs. Yeah. Um, so it's two and a half sales rep. What do you have for like, do you have like a, like a foreman or somebody like runs the crew and like the operations side of it? Yep. So we've got an operations manager. He is our guy who works in the, in the warehouse. We have a 10,000 square foot warehouse. Um, so he handles all of our materials. He gets the, the jobs ready um, or the materials ready for the jobs. And then he runs our crews. So, you know, as far as full-time employees, it's me, my wife, she, she runs the office and then yep. I've got our operations manager and then two and a half sales reps. And then we have four, four crews of, of subcontractors who do the installations. Is it pretty easy to find those subs? It, it the... can be, you, you, you do have to put in some, some time and effort into finding these guys, like whether it's through, you know, posting on Craigslist, posting on Facebook marketplace, looking at guys who've posted on Facebook marketplace, trying to sell their services. Mm. And they're saying like, you know, you know, a lot of them might not speak great English and they don't have a great ad out. And so you just, you know, but you, you message them, you got to, you know, go through a bunch of duds to find the, the yep, ones that are really yep. good it's and like you got to try them out. Exactly. Yeah. So you basically just have to hit them up and it's a full-time job trying to recruit just like anything else. And yep. you try to find the good ones. And when you find a good one, you take good care of them and you treat them well. And then when you have a crew, you try them out and they don't do what's expected. You get rid of them quick and you just yep. take care of the ones that do do well. Yep. That is what we're our plan with, you know, that one painter. It's the same thing with hiring painters. It's the exact same thing. You take care of them, you pay them on time. You don't bullshit around. You feed them consistent work uh, and you treat them well. And, and they should be, you know, there should be more people knocking on your doors. Like you can build that reputation. Mm -hmm. um, so what, um, do you ever go W2 on it, on the crews? Like if you find really good guys or is it the kind of thing where you, where you don't? Um... A lot of other locations use, um, in, we call them internal crews or W2 yep. employees. We, because we're a seasonal business, I, mm -hmm. I didn't want to go that route because we're only installing like really busy for nine, nine months out of the year, really. And yep. then we take a huge, huge break during winter right now. So I didn't want to have to worry about laying off guys and doing all that during the winter and, you know, trying to keep people busy. So these guys will go on their own, you know, they'll go snow plow. I don't have to worry about laying them off and unemployment insurance and all the overhead that goes along with that. So yep. I, I think this model works great for us. Um, I don't think we're going to change anytime soon. Yep. Um, yeah, it makes sense if, yeah, yeah. Especially in your market and being more seasonal, you're up in like seven, Minneapolis, the ground is frozen. You can't, you can't dig. Right. Um, that's exactly. Kind of the rule. Um, what do you, how, you know, so one of the questions people talk about is like, how, how much do you buy initially, right? You look at one territory, do I get three? Do I get five? Do I buy all 10? Like, did, did, you know, what was your kind of process to determine like, what, you know, four, you know, is four the right number? Would you, do you wish you would have done more or less? Like, talk me, talk me through that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, you know, I, I knew how big, just based on like the FDD, like, roughly how big one like one territory could get like say you're in a, a smaller medium-sized city and you're really just one territory like i kind of knew what that could max out at um like What's looking back uh they they say that like if, if you just like look at the if i was to look at the yeah. rankings um you know i'd say two maybe two to three million is, is yeah. roughly like how big you could yeah, get if you're sense. in a like one territory smaller city um i knew that okay, there's like eight, like nine territories available here. I thought about buying like all nine, but I was like, well, I don't know. This is my first, my first yeah. time yeah, um, yeah. owning a business. I don't know if I want to go all in. So I ended up settling on, on, on four just for that reason. Like, and of course, in hindsight, I kind of wish I had bought all nine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it just depends. Like every brand's a little different. Like, as you know, for T1P, like they tell you, okay, you're, typically one territory, you know, gets you to here, 
you know, and then you can kind of scale it depending on how many you buy. Um, yep. So that, that, that's, that's what I did. That, that's kind of the math that I did is I knew where I wanted to get to, you know, I knew where I would max out at it with four of them. And that's a number that I felt comfortable to by. say, Hey, I want to build a $10 million business to do that. I think I'm going to need four ish, right? You kind of like, this Precisely. It's, it's, uh, it's exactly. It's, yeah. That's my it, goal. Like it, exactly. If, if I could get this to 10, that would be, that that's really my, my, my goal in the next, you know, five years. Yep. So you get it to 10 and then that, you know, as you grow, right, that allows you to have the budget to then re replace yourself and hi hire really good people and pay them very well to then take off, you know, take on the load that, that you're doing, right? Uh, and exactly. then, then you can then focus on the next, you know, growing in, in, in whatever vertical you decide to do next. Exactly. That's that, that's exactly what I'm trying to do right now is is get myself out of the, the weeds, the day-to-day, -day, so to speak, you know, I'm constantly putting out fires and dealing with all that myself when really I think my time would be better served looking at other brands and um, and so that's what I'm working on right now is looking at what other brands are out there and getting out of the weeds. Yeah. Yeah. It's a challenge. Honestly, everybody struggles with that too. And it's like, it's, it's re going and re replacing yourself. Like the only way you get to the next level is re to replace yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and it's to f like forward invest in, in the sense that you're like investing in this person prior to when you actually need it, like before it's breaking, you're making the investment. Uh, mm -hmm. that has been at least my, my experience as we've grown our, our company is, and now I can, we've got a really good team and now it's like, well, yeah, but we're still like continuing to ask that question of, all right, well, where do we, where do we invest in people now that gets us to, you know, 50 million or 60 million or whatever. And, you know, while there immediately may not be an ROI, we know that like, it's, it's necessary for us to, for us to grow. Um, so you know, yeah, I, I think and that's key for you as you, you know, you know, you're, you you can clearly build a business, right? And like, where are you going to get the best ROI and your time invested? And it's 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 not in the weeds, right? Um, exactly. The next thing. Like I, I caught myself, I don't know how many times last year, like driving around, picking up trailers from job sites and honestly doing like little repairs myself, like because it just needed to get done. And, yep. you know, my operations manager is busy doing a million other things. And I'm like, golly, like, I don't come like I'm not a contractor like I don't come from a contractor background. Yeah, yeah. but I just kind of you just kind of got to do whatever. Yeah, you do whatever it takes. Take, like in the beginning. the beginning. Yeah, yeah. You, d you do whatever it takes, and then it's a matter of part of it's like what your goals are too. Like, is your goal to build this empire where you want multiple brands, multiple cities, whatever? Or you know, other people it says, hey, like I've got this great business, we've got this great you know job. I'm making I'm making good money. Like I spend my day how I choose to, right? So like. A lot of it depends on kind of you and your goals and like, you know, your timeline for wanting to achieve these things, right? Exactly. I completely agree. And um, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been very fortunate and glad to have gone down this path, honestly. T t talk about the like validation process. You, you find this brand, you talk to them, like, you know, the validation, I get talk, talking to other franchisees, like what kind of what was your process um, to, to ensure that like everything you were seeing from like the outside was, was valid on the inside? Yeah. So um I discovered this brand actually in diligence as I was evaluating another brand. Um, so I was calling around, you know, when I was evaluating, fencing, a, you were looking at another, another exactly. I was company? looking at a, no, not even in fencing. It was totally unrelated. Okay. Um, a totally unrelated yeah. brand that wasn't even in home service. I, I, you know, it wasn't a good fit for me. I'm not going to say which one it was, yeah, but yeah. Um, it wasn't a good fit. I was calling around owners of that brand and, um, one of the guys I talked to is also, he was evaluating superior fence and rail and he was like, Hey, look, this brand's doing, a, it's doing all right, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I, I think you should really look at this other brand superior. I think they're going to be exploding here in the, in the, in the country, you know, territories are getting bought up. You should look into it. I was like, Hey, okay. I'm, I'm agnostic. Like I'll look at anything right now. Like I'm, I'm happy to look into fences. Like I don't, I don't know anything about fences, but sure. So then I went down the path. I got in touch with Zach Payton. He's the president. Um, and he was doing all the sales for the territories at the time. And so I spoke with him, got a really good impression. He's um, army, army guy. Um, didn't, didn't like never throughout the whole process. I, I never felt like I was tr getting sold to. That was one mm. thing that I really liked was that he's just a really straightforward guy. He's going to tell you, here's what, here's our model. Here's how we're successful. Here's what we do. And throughout all the calls that you have with them and other franchisees, like I never even got like, it wasn't like he like did a follow-up with me even where he was like, 
hey, so you're going to sign? You're going to sign? Like, it was more like, like I had to follow up with him. Like, yeah. And I learned right before I was about to sign, you know, that he does it on purpose. Like, he doesn't want people who are like half sold to just buy in. Like, he wants people that are committed and are going to follow up and do the work and that are bought into his system. And so that I, I realized that was his, his, his model and the way he, he sold and chose people. Um, and so that, that, that's one thing that, it's one of the big reasons why I decided to go with this brand yeah. was because of him and, and his vision. Yeah. And the leaders, you know, especially in these, these, you know, er- emerging brands, it's the leadership is what matters, right? And it's the people and they've got the vision and like, you know, how is he doing putting in the selection, right? His, the success of the brand is really the success of the individual franchisees. And are these guys picking the right people or are they selling to anybody, which is what then the, you know, these brands and crash and burn because <laughs> they got a bunch of people who maybe got money, but they don't have the drive. They don't really want it. They're not into it. And so um, exactly for any of these brands, we're, you know, we, we talk about it's, it's the, the, the leadership is what matters more than anything else. A hundred percent. And, and that's, and that's what I learned. You know, I spoke, I still spoke with, you know, six or seven different uh, superior fence and rail franchisees before I bought in and all of them echoed the, you know, what I had been getting from Zach. And so I said, all right, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. Yep. What about the, what about the, the idea of a, of a seasonal business, right? I think it takes, you know, you got to like, you're going to be good with like three months of like zero income, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, I mean, especially in your market, and obviously different markets have different time periods. You're, you're way up in the North, but like, you know, some people like it would drive, like, I don't know. I don't know if I could do it to be honest. Like, I think it would drive me crazy of like, what am I going to do like each day? And then other, I talk to other people who like say, Hey, this sounds great. I get like three months to like relax and like travel and I can make a year's worth of money in nine months. And like, they look at it, not as like a, they look at it as like a positive thing. Like they want that. I mean, is that, is that kind of how you approached it too, going into this thing, knowing like, Hey, and do you still feel that way after, I guess, as, as after today in January with, you know, no money coming in? Yeah, there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely yeah. pros and cons to, to seasonal. I mean, I'll be honest, like my wife and I, we just, we just got back from, from Cabo, you know, last week because I mean, it yeah. was literally the high was like negative one here. So it's like, okay, we're not installing obviously. Um, so there's pros and cons. Like, obviously I've got a budget you know, X tens of thousands of dollars that are going to basically be lit on fire through the winter um, because I've still got bills to pay. I've still got rent to pay, insurance, you know, my general liability, my workers comp, all that stuff. Still got to get paid. Going to have zero money coming in. Um, So if I'm being honest, I didn't want a seasonal business when I was evaluating brands. And then as I talked to Zach and, and people, you know, more about it, like that was my biggest concern. And then I just realized, well, we're just going to have some, some like already set aside, like time off. Like that doesn't sound so bad as long as we budget for it and we know what our expenses are and we can cover that, like we're going to be fine. And so now that I've gone through a couple winners, um, it's actually been really nice to take like a breather and evaluate and take a step back. And so like now during this off time, I'm trying to focus and learn a lot more about like getting into commercial. And so I can take the time and, and learn about it and go to trainings and talk to other owners and work on the business as opposed to just the yep. day-to-day of being Working in it, in it. Does so. superior is that when they have their conference and like, is everything happen in the off season then for them? Yeah, exactly. It's coming up here in the next uh, two or three weeks in Vegas where all okay. the owners um, will get together and superior is under a bigger umbrella called empower brands. And there's a bunch of other, you know, there's a deck company, a lighting company, uh, a bunch of outdoor uh, yep. other brands that are all meeting up together. Yep. Okay. Uh, what do you do about your payroll, about like your GM, your salespeople? What are you doing with them through the winter? So yeah, our, you know, our sales reps are, are fully commissioned. So from the beginning, I told them like, look, you know, you're going to make X percent of everything. You know, you're going to eat what you kill. Um, it's going to get slow in the winter, but you're going to make enough money in as long as you're, you're doing, you know, budget. Yep. Yeah. As long as you're budgeting and you're doing this much in sales in nine months, you know, that should be enough money for a normal, you know, to last you for, for 12 months. You know what I mean? Like you're making yeah, a 12 a month year's worth of money income. in nine months, right? Exactly. Like, and if you're doing what you need to be doing and you're selling and you're closing at a, at a, that rate, then, Hey, if you want to go work in the, in the winter for do something else part-time, then go for it. If you want to rest, then that's fine too. Yep. Have you checked in with them? Like, are they, everybody's like, good. They have other jobs. Like, have you, I guess that's part of it. Probably some sort of communication. 
Oh yeah, we're we're still in touch quite a bit. And honestly, even though it's winter, we still have like leads coming in. Like when we're really busy during season, our sales reps will have three or four every day, you know, okay. so roughly 15, 18 estimates a week. And right now they're still going out and doing, you know, as long as it's, you know, above zero, you know, they're still going out and doing. Okay, least, it's still going, you know, they're getting deposits, you know, you're yeah. just not doing, you're just, you're scheduling it for the, the March or whatever, right? Exactly. They're still going out and selling. They're only doing maybe, maybe three to five estimates a week right now. It's much slower, but they're still going yep. out here and there. Yes, yeah, so if you don't mind, so 15 to 18 estimates a week, what's a good close rate? A good close rate would be like 30% is solid. Okay. Where are you guys at? We close, so combined between me and all of our sales reps, we're, we're right about there. We're, I think okay. like 29% overall. And then what's the, what's an average job? Our average ticket here in our market is right in between nine and 10,000, about 90, 9,500. Okay. And, um, you guys offer payment plans to good people? We do. Yeah, we do. We, we, do, financing do a lot. is, is, do a lot yeah. Of we do. I'd say it's roughly maybe 15%, 15 to 20% of our sales are financed. So that was another great thing about being part of a franchise is they already had that set up with, uh, you know, yep. the finances. Is, it, the is it really easy? They just like click a button and do it. It's so easy. Like, again, the, that's like the benefit of the franchise. Like when the customer sees our estimate that's in their inbox, they click the link, open it. And right at the top, it says like, click here for financing. It's like right in there yep. already. So we do get your, do your salespeople uh, focus on that too as part of the, in the discussion? Absolutely. Definitely. Yep. That, that definitely sets us apart over, you know, it's, the chuck and a trucks out there. Yeah. It's a huge part of like in the Midas business, you know, we do 30, over 30% is like our, our targets. I have stores that do 50% and we're talking mm -hmm. like $350, $1,000 repairs. Right. Uh, but what we find is that people do, who utilize our, the payment plans uh, are twice as loyal and they spend twice as much. And so, mm -hmm. Because you know, anyway, so it, it and it's huge, and and you know, even in in T1P, as we get into this, like they don't do any financing, like it's it's like zero. Now they have options, and that inter mm -hmm. literally integrates with with our estimates, and so our team is going to be like, because you know we're comfortable with it, but like we're going to be pushing it pretty hard, and you know we're looking at similar numbers, and it's probably gonna be a five thousand dollar average ticket, but like, mm -hmm. hey, if you can get this done for eighty nine bucks a week or whatever, whatever the numbers are, and we get paid the next day, and it's affordable for them, like it creates these win wins. Um, so it's like a, I don't know, we're really comfortable in the retail space. I think it's I think it's really underutilized in home services is 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 financing and helping making it affordable, and it's it comes down to the salespeople's ability to talk about it. That's like that's what makes it different. Um, a hundred percent. I completely agree. And there, there's, you know, there's some other franchisees and in, in, in Superior that they they don't really, they don't really utilize it. And, you know, everyone can run their business however they want, but I just see so much value in it. You know, yes, we pay fees on it, but that's business we probably wouldn't have had otherwise. So. Yep. Yep. Uh, so what's, what's next for you? What does the future look like? And, you know, if we talk from a year from now, what is, what does your business and life look like? Yeah. Great question. Hopefully, um, you know, I am exploring other home service um, brands. I, I just, I've, ever since doing this and realizing just like, and going all in on home services with Superior and just realizing the opportunity out there, especially with the number of other brands, you know, T1Ps out there. Um, you know, I think there's a good chance that I'll be expanding into another brand here very soon um, outside of fencing. So. Yeah, probably awesome. going to get into another brand here very, very soon. Okay. Is is there an opportunity to grow within Superior in terms of more territories or adjacent or like, what is the growth path? I mean, you can grow same store sales, but what's the growth path if you wanted to grow geographically? I would say in, in my, like in Minnesota, probably not. Like if somebody hadn't already bought the Northern territories above yeah. me, I would have bought those for sure. Uh, but somebody bought those just a few months after me and, um, had those still been open, I would have scooped them up for sure. Um, but yep. there's really, you know, I don't want to, I, I, we have one warehouse and it's in Minneapolis. Like I don't want to start venturing out an hour and a half, two hours away. Cause that's just way too much drive time. Like I would have to get a whole nother warehouse. Yeah. You would have to build setup. out another city. It says, Hey, I'm going to get into I don't know, somewhere in Wisconsin or, or, or whatever, yeah. whatever the next adjacent thing is like, and you're building the whole team and it's like a, like you're duplicating what you got. Um, right. 
So I think in my metro, I'm, I'm probably maxed out with the territories I have, you know, unless I wanted to venture out down into like, you know, an, an adjacent yeah. city and open a whole other location. But I'm probably, I don't, I don't want to go into like another state and run a business yep. from another, from, from here. Versus saying, Hey, state. let me, instead of doing that, I'll do the model where I'll just stack brands. I'll have fencing, I'll have a you know, home service, I'll have whatever, painting, roofing, electrical, right? Mm-hmm. You can stack brands, potentially run everything out of the same warehouse depending on or expand your warehouse, right? So you, you probably have some cost savings and some, you know, you hire a back office person, you get your wife out of that role and like that one person mm-hmm. can then do it all. Like there are definitely like synergies you can create uh, as you build the muscles. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that's, that's exactly what my, what my plan is. So yeah. Awesome. Cool. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. I think it's you know pretty inspiring for anybody out there, you know, kind of in corporate America, you know, looking at the SMB deal, not wanting to take three to $4 million of personal guaranteed debt. Instead, you take three to $400,000 of personal guaranteed debt. And, you know, it's possible to build a, a you know, a million dollars, you know, a $4 million or whatever dollar business within, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a relatively short time period. Right. Um, but yep. You know, everybody's different and obviously, you know, you're in the game and you're working it every day and you're, you're making it happen. So. It's amazing. I um, appreciate it, Brian. Thanks cool. Where can people, if, if they're interested in connecting with you, where could they, where can they, you know, reach you? Yeah, I'm on, um, I'm, I'm more of a lurker on Twitter than I am a poster. Um, but my handle, it's the letter J letter N and then my last name, R A N E. I'm on LinkedIn, J A Y R A N E. Um, those are probably the best two places. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Thanks again for coming on and sharing your story. And I'll look forward to kind of watching your journey. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Jay.